give it just 30 more seconds and then we'll get started. Okay, so I think we are ready to get rolling. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, my name is Joyce Mulvaney and I am the communications manager here at the RMLD. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight for our webinar on electric vehicle charging strategies. Just a few housekeeping items before uh, we get started. Uh, the session is being recorded. Um, all attendees are muted with their camera um, off. And uh, you can enter questions into the Q&A that's at the bottom of your screen. Um, also, you will receive an email with a link to the recording and some other information uh, later on this week. So just be on the lookout for that. I'm sorry, I lost my controls here. Okay, so. Here's the agenda for tonight's presentation. Um, so I'll start off by talking about RMLD and electrification. I'll talk a little bit about the basics of EVs and charging, and we'll also touch on uh, RMLD uh, EV programs and rates. Um, I will then pass it off to Mohammed from Boltrek, who is uh, one of our guests tonight, and he will uh, touch on some trends in EV charging. And then we'll have our panelists join us to talk about charging strategies for three different um, scenarios, uh, and we'll wrap up with some Q&A. Okay, hey, so for those of you who are maybe a little bit newer to the territory, um, our multi is a not-for-profit, municipally owned uh, utility. Uh, we serve Reading, North Reading, Wilmington, and Linfield Center, which is a population of about 70,000 people. Uh, we have a five-member board of commissioners that governs the utility, and they are elected by Reading voters. And then we also have a five-member citizens advisory board, which is appointed by the communities we serve. And uh, that board makes recommendations to the board of commissioners. Uh, all those meetings are open to the public, and the dates are posted on our website. Um, the meetings are still being held virtually. So before we get into EVs and charging, it's important to talk about why the transition to electric vehicles is important, uh, and that comes down to electrification. So electrification is the shift to powering end-use devices with electricity instead of fossil fuels. Um, and some examples of that include electric vehicles, of course, uh, heat pumps for building heating and cooling, and then industrial manufacturing as well. Electrification is important because it's really essential to reducing carbon emissions. Uh, in 2021, uh, the state of Massachusetts passed a climate law, which had several elements. Um, one of the elements is requiring that the power sold by electric utilities, including municipal utilities like Reading Light, uh, be increasingly non-carbon and eventually net zero by 2050. Uh, and then it also targets increasing electrification in transportation and buildings. So basically, as electrification, uh, excuse me, as electricity usage increases due to electrification, uh, the electricity that powers those end uses will be increasingly non-carbon. And so it's a combination approach to meeting um, carbon reduction goals. So let's quickly go over the types of electric vehicles. Uh, we have uh, all electric or battery vehicles. Uh, which run solely on electricity and are charged by either a wall plug or an EV charger. Uh, Plug-in hybrid electric vehicles run on electricity and also have a backup gas engine. Uh, the batteries in these vehicles are usually smaller, but they do have a, a good total range uh, using both fuels. Uh, and then fuel cell electric vehicles, which run on hydrogen and are mainly found in California. These vehicles really aren't the focus for tonight, but we just wanted to uh, make you aware of them. So what are the benefits to driving electric? Um, first off, cost savings. Um, so when you look at the total cost of ownership, including available rebates, tax credits, um, savings on fuel costs, savings on maintenance costs, most electric vehicles are actually cheaper than comparable gas vehicles. Um, PlugStar is a good tool we put in here. And basically, you can compare 
gas and electric vehicles to see the cost of total ownership over time. So that's something to uh, look into. We've already touched a little bit on environmental benefits, uh, but battery electric vehicles have zero tailpipe emissions. Uh, hybrid electric vehicles have reduced tailpipe emissions. And even when these vehicles are charged with electricity generated from fossil fuels, less greenhouse gases are emitted. Um, that's only gonna get better as electricity generation becomes cleaner over time. And then performance. Uh, a lot of folks don't know that EVs provide maximum torque from a standstill. So when you hit the accelerator, they really do go and they are very fun to drive. Okay, so um, charging and range anxiety remain among the top reasons why consumers are hesitant to purchase an EV. Um, and EV charging really is a change in mindset compared to what we're all used to with gas vehicles. Um, so with gas vehicles, we have more of a fill up mentality. Um, you fill up your tank when you're close to empty, you take a intentional trip to a gas station and you don't go back until you're empty again. With electric vehicles, you know, it may be the case where you need to charge because you're low, but generally speaking, it's more of a mentality where you charge when you have the opportunity to do so when your vehicle is parked, um, whether it's at home, at work, or perhaps if you are out running errands and there's a charging station that you can utilize. So it's a little bit more about opportunity as well. So there are three charging levels. Uh, level one is a standard plug. Uh, every EV comes with a cord, which allows you to plug the vehicle into a standard outlet. It does vary by vehicle, but level one uh, will give you approximately 35 miles of range when charged overnight for say eight to 10 hours. Uh, level two provides a faster charge and requires a 240 volt outlet. Uh, level two charges can be installed at most homes, though some electrical work may be required. Um, many public chargers are level two as well. So it varies by vehicle, but level two will give you approximately 23 miles of range per hour of charge or 220 miles overnight. And then of course there's DC fast charge, uh, which provides the fastest charge and those are only available publicly. Uh, these chargers can provide uh, an 80% charge in 20 to 60 minutes. It does depend on the charger and the vehicle. Um, some fast chargers are exclusive to brands like Tesla, whereas others uh, can be used by any EV with fast charging uh, capabilities. And fast chargers are most commonly found along highways. So an important um, piece is where to charge. Um, and it's important to know that about 80% of charging actually takes place at home. Um, home charging can be level one, which is the standard wall plug as we discussed, or it could be level two, which offers uh, faster charging. Um, at home charging can be challenging for people who live, um, say in an apartment or condo and don't have access to outdoor power. Uh, so RMLD is working on developing options and solutions for apartment and condo complexes within our service area. Um, and if you do live in this type of community and are interested in um, driving an electric vehicle, um, you should definitely let your management company or condo association know. Um, at work charging is another option. Um, most workplace charging is level two. Um, if your workplace doesn't have on-site charging, uh, we would definitely encourage you to ask your employer to consider it. Um, RMLD offers rebates for within its service territory, and then there are some state grants available as well in the state of Massachusetts. And then on the go or public charging stations are either level two or fast charge. Um, the availability of public stations has been steadily increasing in recent years, and this trend is going to continue. Um, PlugShare is a great uh, tool to find charging on the go, and I'm going to show you uh, what that looks like in the next slide. So this is just a, a screenshot of the PlugShare tool. Uh, it's a free tool that allows users to find charging stations nearby. Uh, and it's available via a web browser or an app that you can download. Uh, so the map can be filtered by charging level, charger network, uh, whether the charger is available and more. Um, and the app also has a trip planner to help you plan out um, charging over long distances. So we've already talked a little bit about the difference in mindset from EV drivers when it comes to fueling um, and that they charge when needed, but also when charging is available and convenient. Um, there are some utility level considerations to when you charge, which we also wanted to share. 
So uh, when you charge your vehicle, may have implications for the electric grid as well as wholesale power supply costs. Um, those of you who are familiar with our time of use rate or our Shred the Peak program are probably somewhat familiar with the concept. Um, both of those programs are intended to encourage customers to shift electricity usage to off-peak hours when electricity is less expensive and in lower demand. Um, so RMLD has, currently has one time of use rate with one kind of set for the future. Um, the time of use rate consists of different pricing tiers depending on the time of the day the electricity is used. Um, these rates incentivize customers to shift electricity to off-peak hours, um, but it also helps customers to save money on their electric bill. Um, it's important to note that most vehicles have the ability to schedule your charging, so you can still uh, plug the car in when you get home, um, and you can have it scheduled to start charging at a certain time to coincide with off-peak hours, which is really useful if you are on the time of use rate. So this is just an, to give you an idea of the fueling cost comparison of gas versus electric. So as you can see, the annual fuel cost for a gas vehicle, uh, when looking at um, the average price of gas, the uh, fuel economy and mileage per year, is over $1,400. Um, on RMLD's residential electric rate, the annual fuel cost for an electric vehicle is significantly less, so like over $800 a year less. Um, and EV owners that sign up for time of use rates, uh, which I'll talk even more about in the next slide, um, can save even more money. So it really is a significant savings um, as far as fuel is concerned. Okay, so um, RMLD EV programs and rates. Uh, so we have a residential uh, EV charger rebate, um, which is for up to 750 uh, for a networked level two charger. So it covers the equipment only, but in most cases that will cover all of the equipment because most costs less than that. Uh, if you do take advantage of that rebate, um, you do have to sign up for time of use uh, and for a minimum of one year and agree to share your EV charging data. Uh, we also have a commercial EV charger rebate, which is for 50% of costs up to $1,500. And then again, the time of use rates I mentioned, we currently have one, which uh, has two pricing tiers. So it has on-peak and off-peak pricing. Peak hours are Monday through Friday from noon to seven, and then the rest of the hours are off-peak. Um, and you save quite a bit of money by using more electricity off-peak. And then coming soon, we're going to have another um, time of use rate, which is more EV focused, and that will have repricing tiers. Um, so that's something that we will probably be able to announce um, within the next few months. So definitely be on the lookout for that. And so before I pass it off to Sarah, or excuse me, to Mohammed, I'm gonna check in with Sarah and see if any questions have come in. Yes, um, we've got a few. Um... One is about um, the average cost of a level two charger installed at home. Um, I gather that's around $400, $800. Um, but, and we do offer rebates for that, as Joyce mentioned. Um, yeah, and it's going to depend to on um, what, what electrical work might be needed at the home. But the charger itself, I think, is uh, less than $600 uh, most of the time. Yeah. Um, and then another question for level level one charging at home, any requirements on min minimum amperage for the circuit being used? Um, Greg, did you want to answer that one? I was reading, say that again, the question, sorry. Um, for level one charging at home, any requirements on minimum amperage for the circuit being used? Uh, no, it's a, so in terms of minimum amperage, typically most, Plug circuits are either 15 or 20 amps. A uh, typical level one charger will run either eight or 12 amps. So it should work on, unless it's a really old home with uh, old wiring, it should work most, most likely. Thank Great. you, Greg. Um, and then one more question, I guess, for Greg before we move on to the next part. Um, are there any more public stations expected in Reading? Are there more public um, charging stations? Yes. So 
Um, we currently are in the process of installing five, uh, three in Reading, um, two in Wilmington. Um, we, we're basically budgeting uh, somewhere between five and seven across all four towns. That's uh, Linfield Center, North Reddington, um, Wilmington and Reading over the next five years. So you'll see a steady increase. Those will be Reading, Reading installed ones, RMLD installed ones. And then uh, several of the um, uh, companies that operate are working on installing, uh, they're working with on in terms of installing chargers. And, and then also several of the retailers and the commercial establishments are doing the same. So you'll see a pretty steady growth. Okay, thank you. So um, I, I'm assuming we're good to go with questions. So I'm going to um, ask Mohammed to join. Um, Mohammed is from Voltrek, uh, and he's going to give us some good stats on EV charging. Um, so I am going to go ahead and mute myself and pass it off to Mohammed. Good evening, everybody, and and uh, uh, Joyce, thank you. Uh, for having me here today and for everybody, thank you for joining the call. My name is Mohammed. I'm the account manager here at Voltrek. Uh, Voltrek is a woman owned small business enterprise based out of Lawrence, Massachusetts, and is the leader in turnkey EV charging installation services in the New England region. We have so far installed over 3,200 plugs and counting. So, um, as um, in the interest of time, I won't be taking any questions during the presentations, but I would be happy to answer any questions at the end of the webinar. Um, so, let's get started. So, we'll be covering EV trends, uh, EV charging in Massachusetts, um, a little bit about range anxiety that uh, Joyce touched earlier, um, future of EV charging, and some of the new technology that's out on the horizon and then uh, the regulatory influences that um, are shaping how EV charging is adapted in, um, in the state and, and across the country. So in the next few slides, uh, again, we're, we're gonna see a snapshot of EV charging infrastructure in Massachusetts and other states. Um, this is a little bit of a snip that I came across um, from World Resource Institute. Um, and as you can see, uh, basically the growth of EVs uh, in the last few years has been um, you know, pretty substantial. Uh, it's expected by 2028, uh, almost 100% of light vehicles are gonna be um, uh, electric vehicles. And this is, um, even if you consider five years ago, um, I don't think any one of us were talking about this. So it's the, a change is coming, and and it's going to be um, you know not just uh, you know really interesting, but I, I believe we are truly on a uh, paradigm shift in terms of how we um, you know consume our energy. Yeah. Um, next slide, please. So this is a um, quick snapshot in terms of how it looks from two thousand sixteen to two thousand twenty. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you can, you know, you can basically see the growth, um, you know, right up to um, last year. And in terms of what has happened in 2021, um, Tesla alone has delivered close to about a million EVs in 2021. Um, and according to some estimates, global EV sales for 2021 are up 98% from 2020, even with the COVID related disruptions. Um, next slide, please. So EV sales are predicted to sur surpass um, ICE vehicle sales uh, sometime between 2025, or 2035 and 2040. Almost all the major auto manufacturers have declared they'll stop producing internal combustion engines between 2030 and 2040. So it, it's crucial that we have the necessary infrastructure, um, charging infrastructure in place to facilitate this. So there's really um, very little public data available for level one charging. It is something that we just you know, referenced earlier um, during the presentation. Since level one charging happens at home without the use of a commercial grade EV charger, but as evidenced by the data, level two charging stations are the most popular type of charging stations in use today. 
Uh, this is because level two charges can be deployed in publicly accessible areas with relative ease um, and use existing electrical infrastructure in most cases. Most incentive programs also uh, specifically target their funding um, towards level two charging stations. Um, but some other states are starting to narrow the gap um, in terms of you know, funding for both for level two and, and level three stations. The next slide, please. So Massachusetts currently ranked seventh on the list of the number of stations deployed. This graph excludes California, which is far ahead from other states, uh, but in terms of the number, uh, you know, in, uh, just in terms of the number of stations deployed. Uh, but California started well, well ahead of uh, every other state. So we're definitely on the track to catch up with them. Okay, this is again, um, a stark reminder of where California is compared to the other states. Um, but although we seem far behind, if you, we are still in top five states when it comes to level two deployments. So considering the size of a state and considering where we are in terms of EV adoption, this is still an impressive achievement. Uh, level two deployments continue to be very popular in Massachusetts in 2022. We're likely to see large increases in EV charging deployments in 2022 and beyond. Um, as regulatory entities start mandating EV charging deployment for commercial properties, retail spaces, et cetera, um, everybody is, is going to be looking at having charging facilities. Um, so um, the growth uh, is whatever we have seen in the past is, is again, going to pretty much increase exponentially uh, in 2022 and beyond. Uh, next slide, please. You see the fast so, charger slide? Yeah, so this is the DC fast chargers um, slide again, um, leaving out California. Uh, we are at the higher end of the path um, with DC fast charging station deployments. Uh, the, pass of DC, uh, the, the, the pace of DC fast chargers is likely to pick up once the phase three utility program goes live um, here in Massachusetts. Uh, the new Massachusetts Utility Phase 3 program has significant funding for DC fast charger. Um, also, the submissions, Phase 3 submissions, are currently being reviewed by the State Commission, and it's slated to get approved by Q3 2022. Um, it was supposed to take off at the, uh, the start of the year, um, but there are some delays. So right now, uh, there is a little bit of a, um, you know, up in the air kind of feeling, particularly it's, it's, it's because, you know, it has to go through the commission, but uh, it's, everybody is very optimistic that we are going to see the program go live in 2022, which brings a, a lot more funding on the DC side. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of what's out there uh, for technology, um, there are a lot of very, very exciting um, technological innovations that, that we are seeing as the green transport revolution takes hold. Um, solar carports, uh, for one, are gaining in prominence as new models are introduced that integrate solar carports with the EV charger as a package deal. They offer substantial savings in terms of producing the long-term electricity usage for station owners. They can be customized to the size of the parking lot or garage. Uh, station owners can combine solar and EV credit uh, and incentives for a better CapEx coverage. And um, it can, you know, the, uh, a standard um, solar carport can harvest enough solar energy to charge about two EVs for an average con uh, consumption. And also they can be customized. So again, depending on the size of the, the garage, uh, depending on the requirements in terms of the number of stations deployed, um, and also depending on any other requirements uh, for the station owning entity, uh, these can be customized. So there are a lot of advantages of that. Um, my understanding is we're gonna see a lot more of that. It also ties into some of the other stuff that, that's going on out there. There are um, really interesting pilots being tried out in um, New York right now, where uh, a lot of the batteries are being used as energy storage to create a smart grid. And solar carports are probably going to also play a role uh, when that happens. So really exciting. Um, the other um, really um, 
amazing innovation out there is the, the wireless charging. And you know, some of the people on the call might be familiar with this concept. It's also known as induction charging. Um, it's right now fairly slower than conductive or standard wire charging. And there's all, it's also more expensive to deploy, um, but that can change as the technology improves and scales um, in the future. So with uh, wireless charging, uh, the advantages of that is basically that you can start the charging without ever having to exit the vehicle. Um, it works simply with having a receiver um, that's installed at the, under the car and the, the charger um, is embedded into the pavement. So any kind of car can basically just use that space. It, it doesn't have to be and one of the things right now is if, if you have standard spaces that may or may not be suitable for uh, different kind of vehicles, particularly when it comes to he heavy vehicles. Um, this technology pretty much eliminates that where um, not only for um, cars right now, but also as we move forward with autonomous vehicles, um, this will be a, a great technology for use for autonomous vehicles because it's very easy. It could be programmed for the vehicles to basically match up um, to the pavement um, and, and start charging. Um, and then, one of the other concepts I wanted to kind of just share with you today is um, electrified roads. Uh, this is a concept that has been kind of under testing with a company in Sweden. Um, it works similar to existing electrified charging for trains and cable cars, et cetera, except it has tracks within the roadways that contain the charging mechanism. Now, as we can all kind of think about the advantage of that, it, first of all, it really drastically cuts down the charging time. Um, and they're going beyond that. Um, we can anticipate the rep repercussions of that, um, you know, and, and benefits in terms of the amount of charging space right now that we are going to free if we don't have to have cars parked for a long time for charging. Um, it's a wonderful option for all kinds of major metropolitan areas around the world, particularly cities like New York. Uh, where there's heavy traffic and um, real estate is always at a premium, uh, where a lot of the parking spaces combined with autonomous vehicles sometimes in the future could also be, you know, reclaimed uh, for other urban activities. Uh, next slide, please. So this is um, actually really exciting for those of us in the industry. Uh, because the bipartisan um, infrastructure and jobs bill is a game changer for the electrification of the automobile industry. Um, it not only brings the much needed investment in EV charging infrastructure, infrastructure, but also creates a new agency to oversee the deployment of EV charging infrastructure in the country. The White House has also put out an ambitious goal of promoting about 50% electric vehicle sales by 2030. So we're almost kind of <laughs> knocking on the door when we think of 2030. Um, the work is cut out for all of us to help achieve this by ensuring the required charging infrastructure is built um, so we can support the EV adoption. Um, the bill includes significant funding for um, not just EV charging infrastructure, um, but everything related to uh, vehicle electrification. Massachusetts uh, will be the recipient of about $64 million for just for EV charging infrastructure. Um, a lot of this money is going to be funded through state and um, utility regulatory agencies and programs. Um, and uh, one of the very popular program here in Massachusetts itself is the Mass EVIP program. The Mass EVIP program is so popular that it's almost, almost always oversubscribed since it started several years ago. Um, it provides grant funding for installation of EV charging stations under public access, workplace and fleet, uh, multi-unit developments, and educational program. Each sub-program has different percentage of cost coverage. Um, I'll be glad to provide more information to anyone who's interested to learn more about it um, and um, you know, help you um, understand whether you can qualify for the program as well. Uh, the state of Massachusetts um, is a part of a multi-state ZEV task, uh, task force, uh, zero emissions, and they, are, they have a bold commitment of 300,000 ZEV registered cars in the state by 2025. 
Um, in addition, we're seeing a lot of cities, towns, and municipalities consider considering their own EV charging deployment mandates. Um, what it means is basically for everybody who is um, looking at uh, starting their own EV charging infrastructure, um, this is a great time. We have really good incentives. We have a lot of funding coming along. Um, and, um, you know, again, um, as, sh as showcased by RMLD, uh, there is a robust incentive program for EV charging deployment. So I would urge everybody to take advantage of that and, and be leaders in the space of uh, in sustainability. Uh, with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you, Joyce, and thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Mohammed. That was great. Lots of good um, information. Sarah, do we have any questions for Mohammed before we move on? Um, not at the moment. So we can move on. Okay, great. All right. So at this point, I will um, invite our panelists, our three panelists, to turn on their cameras so we can see their faces. Wonderful. Uh, so um, just to introduce what the next portion of the uh, presentation will be, um, we've broken down three scenarios that we think are maybe common to um, drivers and EV drivers. That said, you know, um, there's always a little bit of overlap. There's always people that kind of have different things going on. Um, but we developed these scenarios for the purpose of giving attendees folks watching the webinar, some illustration on how charging can be managed with the different scenarios. So um, we're gonna talk about local driving, which is, um, you know, the vehicle is primarily used locally to run errands, school drop-offs, could be a short commute, you know, probably less than 40 miles a day. Um, the commuting scenario is a little bit more mileage per day. The, the vehicles used to travel to and from work and then other daily uses. And then the long distance scenario, which, you know, you don't take a whole lot of long distance road trips, but it's a question that comes up a lot. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about how uh, our panelists have approached that itself. So we're going to start with the local driving scenario. And to talk about that scenario, we have actually one of our board members. Uh, we have Commissioner Dave Talbot here. And uh, he's going to tell us a little bit about his experience with an electric vehicle and um, how they charge, how they use their vehicle, et cetera. So Dave, why don't you just introduce yourself at first, tell us, you know, what type of car you drive um, and, you know, how you use the vehicle and what you have going on. Sure. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dave and thank you for the presentation and the introduction. <clears throat> for people who are new to electric cars, I think the, the one thing to keep in mind and by the way, I have a, a first generation Nissan Leaf, which came out of the factory with, I don't know, I think they said it was 90 miles of range. It has less than that now, and as a practical matter, significantly less. But the, whatever car you get, your, your outlet in your garage or on the side of your house, uh, can you can plug just the thing that comes with the car into, and <clears throat> you can reliably add 70 to 80 miles of range overnight, like maybe 11 hours of charging. So you go to bed at 10 or whatever, and you're out the door at eight. That's, you're gonna add a good, I think my colleagues here, Mike and Peter, who are the other guys here gonna to talk to you would agree. Even your little outlet is gonna add that level of mileage to your car every night. So all of this discussion about charging is important, but you know, really it's not as scary and a big installation and redoing your home's electrical service, <clears throat> excuse me again, as you, as you may think going into this. Yes, if you need to be doing very long trips and you don't have another place to charge at your destination or you're driving to Ottawa or whatever, it's a whole different story. But I think for most of us and for us, it was certainly it was the second car, or really the third car. It's only used locally. We've absolutely never had an issue. I, I thought when we bought it, we were gonna end up, oh, I gotta put the level two in, uh, which by the way, can be either 3,300 watts or 6,600 watts. And Greg or Joyce, correct me if I'm misunderstanding, but my understanding is a level two can be two, two different levels. And those are actually very different in terms of what demand they might put on your house. But the, what I was gonna just go back to saying is that we found, I just never ended up needing to put it in because that 60 to 80 miles of range overnight, whatever it might be, was really fine. And then little opportunistic moments when we can get something at a shopping mall or somewhere, 
you know, got us over the hump in different situations. So, and I would say that certainly covers the 40 miles of range daily. And I would even bump that up to about 60. Once you get over that, you know, you, you don't want to be relying just on, on the outlet in your garage. That's going to be pushing what you can really do every day. Um, because you also don't really want to be charging the battery up all the way to 100%, which is another thing you have to kind of learn as an electric car owner is that unlike a car where, okay, you fill it up, you don't really want to fill the uh, Peter or Mike, who are also, would you agree, you don't want to max out the battery charge every time because it's actually not good for the battery to do that. It, the, the instructions that are going to come with the car, you're, you'll learn is try to try to charge to 80% unless you really have to have that full range on a given day. And then you'll extend your battery's life significantly. So I don't know if I covered my scope there, Joyce. Um, I just wanted to demystify, you know, that it's not necessarily requiring you to redo everything in your house and, and all this to, to get started with an electric car. Um, yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, so as Dave alluded to, you know, there's several solutions. Level one could be a solution for you and you may not need to uh, do anything or install anything special. Um, Peter's gonna have some good input on that in the next, next piece that we talk about as well. Um, so the point is to kind of change the mentality of that there, there is a solution. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The only last thing I throw in the, into the mix is just how inexpensive the car is to operate. I mean, the fuel cost is lower as everybody has pointed out. I don't, and I don't know why, and Greg will tell me someday, why is, uh, why is it cheaper to power a car with electricity than gasoline? is a mystery to me. And it must just reflect the tax structure or the regulatory structure that taxes gasoline because it's literally half as expensive to power your car with gas. I don't know why that is, um, but that's a whole other question. But other than that, in five years, I've done a set of tires. I've replaced a cabin air filter and that's all I've done to the car. I, there's no oil to change, no antifreeze to change. All, I haven't even had to do the brakes with regenerative braking. The, the, the actual um, wear and tear on the pads is much less. So it, it's, it, the cost of ownership is like shockingly low. So anyway, I'm talking too much. That, those are my main points. That's okay. I'm glad yeah. you brought up the uh, maintaining um, the battery at around 80%. I'm glad you brought that up. And then regenerative, regenerative braking, we didn't talk about that yet. Um, and it's good to mention that so people are aware that with EVs, uh, when you're braking and or even when you're coasting, uh, your battery is charging. So <clears> you can actually uh, gain range. It's kind of similar to like gas mileage on the highway in a way. You know, you can you can kind of if you modify the way you're driving, you can um, gain range or save range. So um, right. it's definitely a good good thing to be aware of. And so. The wear on your brakes is much less too. And the wear is less. Yeah, and you don't have to stand out in the cold and put gas in your car, <laughs> which I'm not looking forward to doing later. So, okay, Dave, stay on, because um, we'll probably have you contribute more. Um, but our second scenario here is commuting. Um, so again, that's, you know, uh, maybe a slightly longer commute, um, 40, 60, 80 miles a day. Um, maybe level one isn't sufficient for your needs, but there still are several solutions. So we have Peter here um, and he's gonna tell us a little bit about how he um, approaches commuting. Um, and Peter, maybe you could just start off with, you know, telling us what kind of car you, um, what kind of vehicle you have, how long your commute is, and then tell us how you manage charging. Sure. Uh, so hi, my name's Peter. Um, I'm a Reading resident and I'm also an engineer working in the electrochemical industry. So I can also tell you a little bit about, uh, I can talk a little bit about why it's so bad to lead, try to charge all the way up to 100%. Uh, if people are interested in that. Um, but yeah, so um, the company where I work is in Newton. I live here in Reading. So that's uh, approximately 40 mile round trip commute every day. Um, I drive a 2018 uh, Gen 2 Nissan Leaf. Um, the sticker range for that is 160 miles. Uh, the way they get that is it's a 40 kilowatt hour pack. And they estimate that you will average about uh, four miles per kilowatt. So you multiply 
the 40 times the four and you get 160. Um, a lot of it does depend on style of driving. Um, you know, there are, there are the people out there who with the Priuses and other stuff uh, did the like hyper miling uh, trend where you try to get the most range you can possibly get out of whatever your source of energy is, whether it's a gas car or an electric car. Um, and this, this is also adapting some of those techniques is also very useful if you find yourself um, a little further from home than you thought or you um, or you've used up more range than you thought you did because you've been going through hills or you've been driving fast on the highway and you you, you, you started off with estimated of like 60 mile of miles of range and you know you're you're go doing something that's like a 50 mile round trip and and all of a sudden your car's saying oh you you might be a little concerned and so then you can you can adopt some of these more like defensive driving tactics to sort of stretch out your range um but in uh sort of to talk more about sort of my general day-to-day -day, um so like dave um i just have the 120 you know outlet on my deck that's what I plug my car into every night. Um, uh, but I also have the benefit that because where I work is a company that is interested, that is focused on electric chemistry, um, they have installed uh, level two chargers. Um, so we currently have one level two charger at my at my work, um, and it has two cords and services two parking spots. Um, we have four or five people who own EVs. Um, so the management's looking to probably install a second one so we can charge up to four people, four cars. Uh, and this is the lower level, level two. This is what, this is the, the, what Dave, Dave was talking about. This is the 33, the 3300 kilo, um, 3300 watt, um, level two. And like with Dave, I assumed that I was probably going to want to at least upgrade, uh, my outdoor outlet to like. The dryer like the the 240 dryer outlet um but really that that hasn't come up yet um if we we are contemplating getting um replacing our other ice car our other our so this is sort of a, our commuter car um and we also have our, our sort of our sort of people mover car which is a prius um and that's what we take to the compost center, you know, with all of our brush. And so we, we might want to replace that sometime soon with some of the electric pickups that are coming out. Um, and with much larger batteries on those, we would probably definitely be looking at upgrading our electrical for that. But um, for just my commuting needs, the, the, one, the 120 is fine. And then I generally try to only do like partial charging at work um, for like, four hours so I'm not like fully charging it up but sometimes you plug it in and forget or whatever so that's great thank you so uh, again the solutions there are many solutions obviously Peter kind of has a you know two-tiered approach he has level one at home he has workplace charging um, which is usually level two um, and then I'm sure if you need to, you've utilized public charging in the past. So it's kind of a combination of things and you have no problem meeting your, your needs as far as the range that you need day to day to get where you need to go. Yep. Yeah. We've um, so, and this will also cover some of the questions that I've seen in the chat. Um, so a lot of the public charging stations, it's you basically, it, it's like, it works like Uber or Lyft or like, PayPal or whatever, you, you sign up, you get an account, you give the account yeah. your credit card number, and then either you have a physical card that has the, the, that you touch to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the system in the garage, or um, a lot of them you can actually uh, turn on your near field um, on, your, on, your, on your mobile phone and then touch that as like you, as if you do, if you, you know, did like mobile, like Apple Pay or Google Pay, like that kind right. of thing. Right. Um, and yeah, and we've used those on occasion. Um, we've used both ChargePoint and um, 
EVGO, which is the, the fast chargers that are um, one thing with the, with the EVGOs is they've partnered with Simon Malls. So any place you find a Simon Mall, you're going to be able to find a, you're more, more than likely to be able to find a, uh, a level three um, EVGO charger. That's great. I didn't know that. All right. Let's uh, look at our third scenario. Uh, Mike is going to talk to us a little bit about this before we get into it. Again, um, you're not buying a vehicle for the few times a year that you may go on a 400 mile road trip. Um, but that said, again, there are ways to charge. Um, and Mike is gonna tell us a little bit about his experiences because he's taken several road trips. Um, so Mike, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, what you drive and then tell us a little bit about your experiences on your various road trips. Sure, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Mike Swiatoka. I have a Tesla Model 3 long range and we've had it, it's the first generation uh, Model 3. So when we bought it, it had 310 mile range. Uh, it's since, that's one thing, it does drop a little bit over time in terms of the total range. So it's down to, uh, it says 287. Uh, but that does fluctuate depending on the weather uh, and various other things. But we um, have owned it for three years now and have taken it on a number of road trips. We've taken it to, my family lives in New Jersey, so we take it down there pretty regularly. Uh, we've taken it to Quebec City, um, which was across the border was the, the first time. Uh, it was a little bit stressful not knowing exactly what the infrastructure is. Um, but with Tesla's supercharging network, um, it does make it fairly easy. You just have to plan things out a little bit more ahead of time for a longer road trip than you would currently, um, mostly to save time. So there's plenty of chargers available. I'll definitely give a shout out for PlugShare. Uh, one of the best things about the app PlugShare is there's reviews of various um, plugging or um, charging stations too. So ones that are frequently, um, you know, out of service or um, frequently very busy, that's usually mentioned there too in the app. So you can watch out for that. You can also find out if they're free. Some places do offer free charging, um, you know, or if you pay for a parking spot, something like that. Uh, they'll give you free charging. So you learn that along the way. Um, when we were in Quebec, an interesting thing that happened was we, I called the hotel ahead of time and asked if there was charging near where the hotel was. And they said, yep, we can give you uh, a parking garage near the hotel. I parked there overnight the first night and I came out the, the morning after and there was a note on my windshield uh, and I looked at it and uh, it was in French, so I didn't know what it said, but the charger was no longer plugged into my, mm -hmm. uh, my car. So I was a little concerned about that. And, um, th but there was another Tesla parked right next to me. So luckily my wife speaks French. I brought the note back to her. She was still in the hotel room and it just said, it, it was a person who lives in the area. They charge there frequently they noticed that my car had finished charging. And so they just took the plug out and plugged it into um, theirs to charge. And they left their phone number, you know, typical uh, nice Canadian uh, approach and left their phone number and said, just call me if you have any questions. So, um, you know, I thought that was, was kind of cool. Um, but, you know, it was overall the trip went really well. Um, you know, you just stop on, uh, you stop the charge. It's like 25, 30 minutes gets you to 85, 90%, which is enough to continue on your trip. So you just time your stops in such a way. Uh, we have cut it close a few times in, you know, kind of, uh, you know, hidden corners in Vermont that don't have a lot of superchargers. I have had to just plug it into the wall and let it sit there for multiple hours. Um, you know, when I was on a mountain bike trip with some friends up there, just plug it into a regular outlet as a backup, um, just takes a lot longer to charge. But um, in terms of the overall planning, the, the software in the car does a really good job too of planning that out. And it tells you, um, it tells you to stay under a certain speed to reach your destination, or, um, you know, it'll tell you, uh, it'll kind of reanalyze the battery on the trip and, and reroute you if it needs to, to get you to a closer supercharger. So it does do a lot of that. 
Uh, and then on the time of use, I'll also say that you can set the car to charge, start charging at a certain time. You can also set it to uh, finish charging by a certain time, which in the cold weather is a really useful thing because it heats your battery and it can get the heat going just before you leave and you get much more um, efficient mileage when you have a warm battery as opposed to a cold battery in the morning. So mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that Peter can talk about that much more than I can, but um, that's just something to know as well. So, that, you know, a lot of these cars have the software built into them to really make it a lot easier in terms of ownership and road tripping. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mike. That's great. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the, the cold weather. Um, and each of you can certainly chime in with your experience, but it is good for folks to know that um, the cold weather will impact your total range. So the range does typically go down um, in the winter time. I don't know if each of you maybe want to speak to your experience to that. I'm not sure if it maybe is oh, yeah, dependent on the Sorry, I'm to, yeah, I'm especially when I don't have the fancy battery heating software that Mike has because I have the first generation leaf. So yeah, on a cold day, it kills the range both because of the battery doesn't <clears throat> operate as well, but also then if you're also using the heat, you know, right. it just it just it's like it's like opening the the, the stopper in the in the bathtub. And your your range just it's like half as much range. So yeah, that's that's one of the things you learn is. That it's it's different than a gas car, and definitely something that people should be aware of when they're thinking about purchasing in our cold New England winters. Um, did you guys have anything you need you wanted to add to that, Mike or Peter? Or? Um, well, I just I the you know the Gen Two Leaf is the still like still has that that issue. So one one of the things is the difference between the Leaves and the Teslas is. Uh, in order to keep costs down, Nissan uh, kind of uh, stuck to their design choices with on the Gen 1, uh, which is that the battery pack is not temperature controlled at all. It is what they call it as air-cooled battery pack. So that means in the summer it's air-cooled, but it also means in the winter it's not heated. <laughs> so um, other than you know, whatever it gets heated from, um, from either charging or being on the road for like, like if like, like when I'm commuting in January, February, like I'll notice that, that my, you know, miles per kilowatt hour for like the first five minutes is really low. But then as the batteries warm up, as the, as I'm driving, then it gets better um, as I go along. Also, um, you know, the leaf doesn't have the the snazzy software to to reroute you uh, as much. Um, it, it will warn you um, if, and it also depends. I mean, just I don't use the nav that much because I'm commuting. I know exactly where I'm going. Um, but yeah, when we've taken when we've taken like we've gone out to some like uh, uh, trust trust um, the trustees properties uh, trustees reservation. Um, where we're like, you know, going, going a little further than we usually go and somewhere we're not used to then like on the way back, it's like we're using the nav and then it's like, yeah. Um, but one of the things that Le the LEAF does have um, is that you can program the uh, climate control to preheat your car when you're, um, before you leave. Um, and then, then if you do that, then you don't have to be running you're, you've already warmed up the cabin. You don't have to be running your the climate control system that's in and hurting your range. Um, gotcha. So that's that's an, that's another little workaround for that. Um, yeah. And there's and at least Leaf has settings where you can tell it like only do that if I'm if I have you plugged in. Like even if I tell you to turn on the climate system, don't do it if you're not plugged in. Right. Um, and I, I wish that the leaf had a like stop charging feature in the app, but it doesn't. Um, Cause it would be really nice to be able to say, like plug it in at night and, and say, you know, I don't want you to fully charge. I just want you to charge for like four hours and then like yeah. warm it up in the morning. But you know. Yeah. yeah it's not a, it's not a Tesla. No. <laughs> 
the Tesla scolds you if you plug it in too many times and charge to 100%, you get this big warning message that says stop charging so much if you're not driving on a, going on a road trip because it'll degrade your battery life. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So just to recap the long distance scenario, um, public charging at service, service areas along the route. You know, Tesla obviously has a really good network, but non-Tesla network is definitely uh, improving as well. Um, so, you know, using an app like PlugShare to kind of plan your route and make sure that you have the uh, range that you need. Um, you can coordinate stops to go along with, you know, a meal break in the middle of the day or whatever. Um, some hotels have chargers, so you may be able to charge at your hotel or other accommodations. Um, and you know, the public charges, again, they, they might be level two also. So you, you might find level two or you might find easy fast charge. So, um, probably in the road trip, um, scenario, a fast charge is more what you're looking for. But again, you know, the moral of the story being there are alternatives and there are ways to charge, but it does take more planning, um, ahead of time. Right. So I'm going to go over to Sarah because I see there are some questions that have come in and, uh, See if there's anything we can throw to our panelists here for questions. Yeah, so we talked a little bit about um, cold weather driving. Are there any effects on the battery um, during hot weather, like when the AC is blasting in the summer? Um, it's gonna be for anyone. Anyone can talk. Yep, yep. Does anybody yes. know? Peter, go ahead. So climate control, hands down, hurts you. Uh, no matter whether it's heating it or cooling it. Um, the, the big advice that the manufacturers give, um, and this is a, also an interesting thing, almost all electric cars come with heated seats, heated front seats, because it's more efficient to heat the seat, to heat you, than to heat the air in the entire cabin. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so um, that's a big thing. Um, yeah. the other thing, uh, this is sort of a Nissan Leaf issue. Um, but because charging heats the batteries and being outside cooking in a hundred degree temps in the summer also heats the batteries doing both at the same time really heats the batteries. <laughs> and if you are going on a long road trip and use a fast charger, in the summer when it's baking, then your battery's really not gonna be happy. So um, that's one thing to, to sort of think around is just, um, that's that there's this, there's been a thing with the Nissan Leafs where they won't actually, it, the software actually won't let you do more than like two rapid charges in a row because they're worried about over, over overheating the batteries. So, hey, so that's Peter. the- yeah, if I could just add to that, just, so I think that's there. The, as you mentioned, there the air cooled, and then there's the liquid cooled battery systems. And as you mentioned, several of the Leafs have the air cooled battery system. The Teslas and some of the other ones have liquid cooled, so that basically uh, compensates for that um, charging in in the heat. And for the same thing, um, as you mentioned, one of you guys mentioned before, being able to uh, while your car is still plugged in early in the morning, preheat the cabin, um, also. Uh, when it gets really cold, like it was yesterday, I think it was yesterday morning, um, the battery system for the liquid cools will actually draw from the battery to keep itself from freezing. And so if you have it plugged in, it will draw from the circuit as opposed to from the battery. And you can also preheat and give you a range. So the, the, the software tied to particularly liquid cooled batteries is getting more and more sophisticated. And as Mike mentioned, it'll prompt you to say, you know, modify your behavior. So Greg uh, also, Greg owns a Bolt for context for everybody. Say what, I'm sorry? I yeah. said Greg owns a Chevy Bolt just for context yeah, so, so for everybody. I, I have a Chevy Bolt that um, in the course of seven months, I put 16,000 miles on it. So I literally drive it every day. Um, so I charge it every day. Right? And uh, I think as, as Dave and, and uh, Peter mentioned, I too have a level two charger at home, but I have not... Um, I have not installed it yet. So I, uh, yeah. I do a level one charger at home and then I, here at work, we have, uh, we have public chargers out, outside here. And so I basically charge here. So charge here basically gets me a round trip pretty easily. So anyway, just for context, there's, 
Charging is not, I was concerned about charging when I first jumped into it, but it has proven not to be an issue at all. Yeah. And what's your, your commute's what, 80 miles round trip or is it more than that? Uh, it's, it's, it's more than that, yeah. I'll, I do I do more than 80 miles round trip. More I'm than not, 80 uh, miles round trip. 160, okay. so each way, I oh, mean oh round gosh. trip. Okay. Yeah. All right, okay, thank you. Um, so it's uh, 8.02, but we'll try to get a few more questions in. Um, Sarah, do you have a... Uh, yeah, um, maybe a question for Mike. Um, someone was asking that about traveling to DC. They uh, someone goes every six to eight weeks to DC. Um, they're wondering if an EV is practical for them, and I think you've made a good case that it is. But maybe you could just walk through a few steps of like how you how you even plan a trip on an EV. Sure. So I, I think it's practical. You just need to build extra time in. So, you know, if you're trying to break the record every single time and get there as fast as possible, it's a different mindset um, than doing that. You do, you will have to stop multiple times for that kind of charge. But along that route, there are plenty of superchargers um, and, and plenty of non-superchargers as well that you can plug into um, and charge along the way. So um, I know it's stopping the charge is not the idea of fill, uh, filling up with gas in three minutes and being back on the road. So it's kind of changing that approach. Um, you know, in our car, it has uh, the touchscreen, it has Netflix, it has Disney Plus. So with two very impatient young children, uh, that makes the charge and charging stops a lot easier. You can just fire up Netflix and they watch that for a little while. And next thing you know, you're back on the road again. So um, I would say that that route to DC is perfectly fine. It's usually when you're going the opposite direction when it's more of an issue. So we go up to, my in-laws live in Maine. We go up to Sunday River, Sugarloaf, up that way where it's trickier because it is colder. So you will have to charge more. There aren't as many superchargers. Uh, even, you know, um, just level two chargers are fewer and far between. You could run into an issue. We were in Vermont where... There was an EV charger. I called ahead to the hotel uh, and the EV charger was where the plow plowed all the snow. So I spent like <laughs> an hour and a half digging out the charger because we had like 10 miles left on the battery at that point. So, uh, you know, but I'll always have that story to tell, I guess. So I mean, that's, that's one way to look More at stories. it. Too. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah. Um, so you can make it work. It's just, you, you, you definitely have to build more time into the trip in order to, to make it work. And you can actually go on the Tesla website too. You can plug in and say, um, you know, I have this kind of car and it'll give you an idea of the number of stops you have to make along that, that route. I don't know what the total distance is uh, on that one, but you'd probably be at least if not two, not three stops for that one. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, if it's a frequent trip, then you'll know eventually know all the good charging spots. Um, okay, another question, maybe for David. Um, so uh, this is a, just reading this question aloud. People have mentioned that range decreases over time, presumably due to degradation of the battery. Um, how long will an EV battery last? Can it be replaced? What cost? And yeah, so so basically just asking about you know you've had your EV for a while is. It, it, your battery is presumably degrading, but you know, are you, do you need to think about replacing it? And if so, when, when would you? When might um, you so I think Peter is the better, has the better engineering mind on this one. I can just tell you that as a first generation LEAF, <clears throat> you know, again, I'm a bottom feeder when it comes to autos. I bought it used for $9,500 as a three-year-old mm -hmm. car with uh, 36,000 miles. It now has 86,000 miles. So I put, I guess we put 12,000 a year on it. That's just from the local driving. It's down to about, it, it says it's down to about 75% of its original factory new capacity. Maybe it's down to 70% at this point. Um, so whatever that means. So that's, that's a pretty big hit on a car that already started out with pretty low range. Um, so what does it cost to replace a first generation LEAF battery? I'm not sure. I think it's around $5,000. It's something like that, maybe $4,000. Um, so you know, and then, but again, I've needed nothing else with the car. You know, there's, there's no clutch, there's no radiator, there's no, you know, all that stuff that we've spent our lives. Oh, I spent $400 on this. Like that doesn't exist in the, in the electric car. So I look at it like either, either we'll replace their battery and then it's one of the college cars or, or something else. So now P 
Peter or Mike can talk about what it costs for the Mike. What is a what? Is, what if your what if your Tesla battery uh, needed to be replaced? What would that cost you? Fifteen grand. Probably something around that. I do think it, it's got a warranty that covers a number of miles and a number of years. Um, I don't remember what it exactly is off the top of my head, but um, it would be pretty expensive to replace. So, and I, and I, but I think also what we're all learning, and I think Peter and Mike might agree, is that if you're careful about how you charge and you avoid what Peter said, which is multiple supercharging on 100 degree days on 1,000 mile trips and you know, things like that, you're probably going to get eight to 10 years out of the car and, and still have maybe easy. You think? Okay. Easy. Easy. All right. All right. And still have yeah. 80% or 70% of the range. So that's pretty solid. Yeah. I mean, mine's a, my, my leaf's 2018 and there's a battery like degradation meter and I'm yeah. still at a hundred. Okay. So have um, you done the least buy thing, the, the plug. So, <laughs> um, no, we, we actually bought it like, the first month they came out okay. um and then my wife totaled it so then we had to buy a second one i see <laughs> so anyway yeah uh, the needless to say the the um led headlights and all the fancy um radar and stuff in the front of a car rear end rear, rear ending someone with one of these cars is not a good idea because the, yeah. the car was completely drivable completely drivable battery pack was fine electronics were fine it was like just the headlights and the insurance just wouldn't touch it wow. um but yeah um if, if you treat your batteries well um i, I think most of the industry the industry standard is they're trying to shoot for pretty much on par with the drivetrain warranties from the on the ice engine so you're pretty much looking at 10 years, 100,000 miles uh, warranties. So that's warranties. Yeah. So that's warranty. Yeah. So, you know, maybe your battery is going to be down at like 70, 75, 80 percent capacity by 10 years. And, you know, maybe it, you want to think about replacing it. But, um, you know, they're, they're designed, they're, they, they have over-engineered these things so that you know when you're charging it to 100 percent, you're not actually charging it to 100 yeah, yeah that's like true. there's there's actually some wiggle room in there but right. but you yeah. don't but you, st you still don't want to do that right. um it's it's you know it, it there it has to do the 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 real the the real nitty-gritty of it is basically um the lithium in the lithium ion forms little uh like snowflake shapes inside the battery and and then that what is what decreases and then that stays as lithium metal and doesn't become lithium ions again and then that's what degrades your performance as the lithium plates out um so that's that's the technical reason for why that happens um there's another thing that degrades the batteries if you smash it down to zero a lot too um but that's actually not as bad as smashing it up to 100 a lot um because Basically, uh, the lithium ion system, the, when you're putting energy, it, it, you get to a high potential state, it, it's actually unstable. Like it doesn't like to be in that configuration. Right. The, when it has a lot of electricity, it, it's not happy. And so, so the more you do it, to, the more you do that to the molecules, the, the less they, they're not happy. So if you, they're really happy in like, the four, the like 20, 80 range, like they're, yeah. they're happy, but you, you go to the extremes percent. and they don't get so happy. Yeah. Oh, Peter, you can have your own webinar. <laughs> your entire <laughs> own webinar. Okay. Um, Sarah, let's do one more question before we wrap up for tonight. Cause it's eight ten. You're muted. Oh, I'm muted. Whoops. <laughs> um, I know you guys all drive sedans and such, but someone was asking about pickup trucks and if uh, you have heard anything negative or any thoughts about those or read anything about them. Um, I want to get in line for one. Um, the only thing that I could say is because the batteries are going to be bigger, um, you're definitely going to want to think about like at least having 240 uh, at home. 
accessible. Level two, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there's a couple different um, pickup truck type utility vehicles that I believe are coming out in the next year or so. But I don't think there's any currently out. No. I think the, the, the Rivian, the Rivian is yeah. out, but oh, is it uh, out? Okay. They're, they're hard to get. And I saw one like a month ago, but it was on the back of a flatbed, which was a little concerning. It's probably getting delivered. Probably getting delivered. Right. Yeah, exactly. yeah, it was getting delivered. Yeah. yeah, they did their initial launch to their like, like their like high, their um, first tier re reservation holders. They're like rolling out these few months. Um, but yeah, cyber trucks delayed, um, F-150, they're, they're delivering the first year's production worth this year. And it's only going to be like 30,000 vehicles out of the like 180,000 that are on the wait list for. So, right. um, yeah. Oh, and the must, but on the, the Mustang's side, out, right? Oh yeah, but yes. it's not a pickup. It's, it's right sport utility. It's sport utility, and I I wanted to maybe upgrade to that, but it's basically the same form factor that I have with my Leaf. The the trunk's maybe a little bigger. Yeah. The battery's bigger. It's sportier. It'll go faster. Fancy, fancy. But yeah, yeah. So there okay. are. Oh, go ahead, Dave. Sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say. I don't know about the rest of you. I'm happy to keep going for a few minutes if if you are, but I don't want to, I don't know when you have a hard stop, but I did want to, this one wrap up thought I did want to share either way. So one is that for those of you who are here, partly because you're concerned about reducing carbon emissions and climate change, as I hope many of you are, we have, uh, RMLT has a great program called Renewable Choice, which now allows you to pay a little more on your electric bill to have really, uh, to make sure we have more solar uh, and wind renewable sources. It, it helps pay for the additional cost of that. We're also marching down to, to having more of that on our grid anyway, but uh, please sign up for the renewable choice and pay a little more to do that. And you know, electric cars are definitely the way, but in the near term from a, a lifetime carbon cycle, you know, the thing to do is drive less. Um, switching to an electric car does not in a systemic way necessarily really do a lot uh, from the manufacturing of all the components of the manufacturing and life cycle of a car. The, the, the differences are not very big right now, I think. So it's really, if we wanna reduce, we gotta reduce by reducing driving. So I know that's a little off topic here, um, but it's not an elixir that suddenly means you don't have carbon emissions. So I, I, I hope nobody would disagree with that. Or if, if somebody would challenge that, then, then do so. But anyway, those are the two things. Okay. Um, so I guess I'll offer um, Mike, if you have any final thoughts you want to share before we wrap up. Hmm. I don't think so. I can say that everybody don't, don't be afraid of the range anxiety or anything like that. Um, if you're looking for an interesting watch, I forget the name of it, but it, the long way down, uh, Ewan McGregor filmed, he did a motorcycle, electric motorcycle trip with electric supported vehicles. Uh, down in South America. So uh, mm. if you've ever experienced, if you're concerned about range anxiety, watch that when they're trying to <laughs> charge these things in the absolute middle of nowhere with no power grid whatsoever. So you're in pretty good hands. You can pretty much get anywhere. Um, yeah. So don't let the range thing hold you back. Agreed. Absolutely. And they're amazing to drive. But like, I mean, yeah. it's just every time I mash the accelerator in my car, it just still is the most mind boggling thing to me. <laughs> so how about you following all, all over yeah no loss. yeah the the uh yeah the the uh the off the line is it's 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 nice um yeah um it's fun it's impressive it's shocking Mike, what, a little bit what, what was that documentary you said again i think it's called the long way down long um, way down Long yeah. Way Down by McGregor. It's on Netflix. It's a series. There. I think there are 10 episodes. Oh, okay. It's great. If, I also if I may, to, yeah, go ahead. I just also wanted to just thank, thank RMLD staff. You know, Greg, Greg is like the architect of a lot of our, you know, our um, energy portfolio and our renewable choice program. And Joyce for her great communications and Sarah also. I just want to thank uh, the, the staff of, of RMLD for all the great work they're doing. Yeah, but I didn't miss anybody. I forget who else is on. 
Well, that, that's terrific. I, I think the, the one thing we wanted to get across to, to the audience is um, charging is typically a worry that people have when they're considering whether they, or not they want to buy an EV. And what, what we wanted you guys to walk away with today is that it's a little bit different than filling your car up with gas. It, it, there is a, there's a mindset, but it should not be a concern. It should not be a reason not to. There might be other reasons why you want to buy a traditional vehicle, an ICE vehicle. Um, so anyway, just th that was the, the key piece. And then whether you're a, a local driver or a commuter or long distance, there are solutions for each one. So that's 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 kind of the, the key takeaway that we wanted you guys to to make sure everybody understood after today. So I, I think David, in addition to the thanks, you know, Mohammed from, from Voltrek um, yeah. was helpful too. You guys heard, heard some of the stuff that he shared as well. Yes. I, 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 yeah, and, and, and I know and Dave, Dave's very generous in terms of, of the thanks. And so it's appreciated. I think the other piece is, um, you know, this, there's a series, there's a lot of different forums. Um, there are a lot of questions. We tried to answer most of them. Um, everybody's learning um, in terms of, you know, how to, how to drive differently, et cetera. Um, and there's a lot of new vehicles coming out. Uh, at, at the end of the day, this, this wave is coming. Um, and they've mentioned to drive less. That's definitely a good suggestion. But if you're going to drive, um, electrics is a very viable alternative, if not for your primary car, for your secondary car. And as Dave mentioned, we're, we at RMLD are working hard to, to make it easier and, and um, increase awareness, but also put financial incentives in place to encourage if you're going to, if you're in the process of looking at a new car, um, look seriously at an EV and put it on your list. Just that's it for me. Oh, the, well, there was one other quick question. I know, Sarah, you, you had, there was a question about our infrastructure being able to, our RMLD infrastructure. So there's, there's the local distribution network and then there's the power supply. Um, and so, as Dave mentioned, we have responsibility to make sure that we have enough power going forward in time. We look out literally decades. We were, our forecasts go out to 2050. Obviously, they're not perfect, but they have a pretty good idea in terms of what the adoption rates of EVs and electrification, air source heat pumps, et cetera. But the other thing that we're doing right now is we have a we work very closely with the, the engineering operations team. Those are the people that maintain the nets, uh, the distribution wire. Uh, nets and lines, as we call them, but the, the distribution network. And so as we continue to replace equipment, typically equipment on a distribution network has a 20 to 25 year life. So we work very closely with the, the E&O team to make sure the pieces that we put in place can handle what they think the load is going to be 25 years out. So we're, we're, we have been for the past couple of years and we're continuing to continue to upgrade the network as we do regular maintenance. So that part of the network is, should not be an issue for us. Right, thank you. Okay, so I will also extend my thanks um, because Dave, Mike, Peter, uh, as our customers um, who own EVs, you've volunteered your time to share your experiences and we really, really appreciate that. And Mohammed, um, for sharing your expertise uh, from your work at Voltrek um, was really helpful as well. So I just wanna really thank you guys for participating. Um, as far as attendees, we'll have a follow-up email that goes out. It'll have the link to the webinar. And I'll also include some uh, link, other links that I think might be helpful as well. Um, so you'll have some resources to look back to. So thank you, uh, panelists, uh, presenters, um, my colleagues and attendees for spending your evening with us. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. So everybody stay safe and take care. Have a thank good you. night. Thank you. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Bye.